doctors on the front lines in Italy with an ominous warning tonight, calling this the apocalypse and telling the world to get ready. They say this is not like the flu, but it's a very severe pneumonia. This is one of the many overwhelmed hospitals. There are hundreds of deaths each day. 627 lives lost in Italy today alone. Here at home, hospitals are already fearing what happens next. Concerned about their dwindling critical life-saving supplies in the weeks ahead. Private companies asked to start making masks and ventilators. New York State currently has the most cases in the country preparing to shut down all non-essential businesses. This comes just hours after California issued a statewide safer at home mandate. The president implementing the Defense Production Act, closing the border with Mexico. All this as the economy continues to falter. The Dow suffering its worst week since the 2008 financial crisis. We are talking to restaurant workers tonight, caught up in the first wave of massive job losses set to sweep across the country. We'll take you to the Army Lab investigating the virus. And we are also continuing to shine a much needed light on the signs of hope during these dark times. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. What a week and likely not one that we will forget any time soon. Not trying to be alarmists at all. We are simply relaying facts and keeping everyone informed because we are all in this together. Our children are being prevented from going to school, bars, theaters, gyms, in-person dining, all non-essential businesses forced to close their doors. Many we know are now working from home as we witness the horror of what's happening around the world and wondering what will happen to us. Here in the largest city in the country tonight, a much emptier New York, as people are beginning to take the virus and social distancing more seriously, a lesson that we can learn from Italy, where this pandemic has claimed the most lives, a staggering spread of obituaries taking over newspapers there, European countries now scrambling to keep up. But we begin with the latest on the crisis unfolding here at home and the growing number of states shutting virtually everything down. Tom Yamas leads us off from New York, now the American epicenter of this crisis. Tonight, a new phase in the war on the coronavirus, and it starts at home. This is the most drastic action we can take. The governor of New York joining California, issuing new mandates. Beginning Sunday, all non-essential workers ordered to stay home, even limiting New Yorkers from using public transportation unless it's urgent and absolutely necessary. Non-stop New York quickly slowing down. This is Grand Central normally. But take a look at today, near rush hour, when Grand Central should be packed with people, it's nearly empty. The goal of the ramped up measures is simple, stop the spread of the virus. With more than 8,500 infected, the cases in New York are the highest in the nation. The governor says the high number due to more testing, with 10,000 tests conducted in New York State alone overnight. Governor Cuomo asking businesses to help with the shortage of crucial medical equipment, offering to pay a premium. Ventilators are to this war what missiles were to wo World War II. Today, President Trump calling this battle against the virus a war, announcing he's enacted the Korean War era Defense Production Act, asking American companies that can, including automakers, to now manufacture masks, gowns, gloves, and ventilators. So we're invoking it to use the powers of the federal government to help the states get things that they need, like the masks, like the ventilators. Can you name any of the companies that you've asked to start making these ventilators or face masks? I will be, but first I want to get the uh, approval from the company because I don't want to be doing that. Okay. You know, well, I assume well, they'd like it, one did of the, the companies, but I didn't, I didn't speak to them about announcing it but I'll announce it. I'm sure they wouldn't be, but we have others also. Health officials here in this country alarmed at some of the figures coming in from around the globe, especially Italy. From Italy, we're seeing a very, another concerning trend that the mortality in males seems to be twice in every age group of females. Tonight, President Trump still insisting he is not considering implementing stay-at-home measures nationwide. I don't think so. Uh, uh, Essentially, you've done that in California, you've done that in New York. Those are really two hotbeds. Those are probably the two hottest of them all in terms of hotspots. This morning, almost 40 million Californians waking up to a new normal. We direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. 
residents allowed out for essential trips only, including the grocery store and the pharmacy for medicine. Governor Newsom predicting if the virus is not contained, 56% of the state's population, more than 25 million people, will have the virus in the next eight weeks. Already you can see signs of the virtual lockdown. The famed Santa Monica Pier deserted. And tonight, more states are joining the effort, like Nevada and Illinois. I fully recognize that in some cases, I am choosing between saving people's lives and saving people's livelihoods. Now that California is on basically lockdown, um, now we're really trying to limit our activities. And tonight, we're hearing from so many Americans across the country about how this crisis is affecting their families. I am very nervous just feeling like when is this all going to end? How hard is it right now? It's extremely hard and we're assuming it'll get harder. I mean, we were even debating should we come out to the park? We feel guilty coming out to the park right now. For one New Jersey family, the virus taking an unimaginable toll. Four members of the tight-knit Fusco family dine within days of each other. Some still hospitalized. The second we start to grieve about one, the phone rings and there is another person gone, taken from us forever. Just such a particularly horrific story. Tom Yamas joins us now. Tom, earlier today we heard the New York governor say the shutdown order will, for businesses will be enforced. But with many law enforcement agencies around the country only responding to emergencies, how will they actually go about enforcing this? You know, Lindsay, it's a fantastic question. I think each government is trying to, local government is trying to figure out exactly how to do this. Some cities have said they're actually going to have police cars go around compliance cars to make sure those businesses close down, to make sure people are inside. Here in New York City, Mayor de Blasio has said he does not want the NYPD to have a heavy hand, but he will have police officers stationed outside grocery stores monitoring what's going on. And in the state of New York, uh, Governor Cuomo has said there could be a civil penalty if people don't follow the rules during this time. Because in some cases, Lindsay, as you know, it is a matter of life and death. For sure. Our Tom Yamas for us in New York City. Thanks, Tom. And now to American hospitals on the brink, many already running low on critical respirators, protective gear, beds, and even staff. Hospital ships now scheduled for deployment and new plans for makeshift medical facilities. The hope here is that doctors never have to turn away patients in dire need of medical help. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has more. Tonight, cascading shortages reported at hospitals around the country. One of the most critical, blood. Right now, we're at like a, a critical shortage of blood, again, common across the country, because no one is, is donating blood. Clinicians telling us those N95 masks are so precious, they're now kept in Ziplocs or paper bags because they're told to hold on to them for up to a week. My mask snapped while I was uh, uh, trying to take it off in between patients and I had to staple it back. But perhaps the most alarming shortage, doctors and nurses themselves, including Dr. Dara Cass, who tested positive. And I was using all the protection I was supposed to. I probably just wiped the surface with my hands and then wiped my face between mask usage. She's working from home now, urging other medical professionals to get tested. Two Navy medical ships deploying, one on each coast to ease the burden. The USNS Mercy heading up the West Coast next week, where a battle is brewing whether it will dock in L.A. or in Seattle. And the USNS Comfort will head to New York in early April. And the Army Corps of Engineers preparing to possibly convert the Javits Center in New York as well as college dorms into makeshift medical centers out of fear beds will run out in weeks. Tonight, we're taking you inside the Ashner Medical Center in New Orleans, now using special respirator masks to protect staff. And across the country, thousands rushing to get tested. At New Jersey's first major drive through testing site, police had to turn people away after just four hours. One of the nation's leading infectious disease doctors admitting the U.S. is not meeting the demand. And we are not there yet. Tonight, the World Health Organization warning young people they're not invincible. The CDC says nearly 40 percent of the people hospitalized in the U.S. are between the ages of 20 and 54. Max Schulman tested positive nearly two weeks ago after traveling to Spain. I was in the Barcelona airport. Um, I was feeling pretty tired. I didn't think too much of it. But then I get home. I fall asleep for six hours. And then I wake up. I take my temperature. I have a 102.7 fever. 
And at that point, I'm like, I definitely need to take action right now. The now 21-year-old in quarantine on Long Island. And 22-year-old Los Angeles resident, Bianca Haliti, taking to social media to describe how her symptoms evolved. Tonight, she says she's proof that the pandemic can impact anyone. I just want to let everyone know that, you know, it's very important to stay inside and follow the CDC guidelines and, you know, take this seriously. And Matt Gutman joins us now live. Matt, how likely is it that hospitals will actually have to turn away patients in need? And have you heard that this is already happening? I've been speaking to doctors around the country, Lindsay, and they're saying that they are expecting that to happen probably in the coming weeks with this spike in incoming patients and this chronic short of shortage of supplies. They think that they're going to have to make this brutal type of triage decision, denying full medical care to the sickest of patients, essentially having to make these life and death decisions about these patients on the spot. There's one other thing that I think we should mention. Earlier in the piece, uh, Dr. Tanya Zacherson from University of Chicago talked about the shortage of blood. I'm told that if this blood shortage continues, the doctors and nurses themselves are gonna have to be the ones that donate blood to the trauma patients in the ER and ICU. Mm. That's how bad this could get. Matt Gutman, thank you continuously for your updates on the, those who are working here on the front lines. We appreciate it. And now we go overseas to the ground zero of this pandemic, Italy, and inside one of its busiest hospitals in hard-hit Bergamo. The horrifying numbers coming in, 627 Italians dead from the coronavirus in just one day. The death toll in other European countries spiking, and the hopeful news out of China. Our Maggie Ruley brings us the latest. Tonight, a glimpse inside a nightmare. A race to save lives in the Italian hospital at the epicenter of the deadliest coronavirus outbreak in the world. And this is just the emergency ward, not the intensive care unit. The ICU is already overwhelmed. Those plastic bubble helmets are connected to ventilators to help the gasping patients breathe. This hospital is one of the most advanced in Europe, but the victims are everywhere, on gurneys, in waiting rooms, in hallways. It's a very severe pneumonia. Every day, 50 to 60 patients who come to our emergency department with pneumonia. They say they want the rest of the world to know that this is what's waiting for them if nations don't lock down. I never feel so stressed in my life. We are doing our best, but maybe it's not. Is not enough. Thousands of volunteer student doctors in Italy are being rushed to the region. And an American relief group has airlifted a field hospital. But there are fears it will not be nearly enough. And Italy's nightmare is now being shared by Spain. Deaths there soaring by 30% overnight, 199 fatalities in 24 hours, over 1,000 total deaths. And Maggie joins us now from London. Italian doctors are warning people there to get ready. And in the Corona Task Force briefing today, it was mentioned that men appear to be disproportionately affected when it comes to fatalities in Italy. Is there an explanation for that? Well, yeah, Lindsay, this is a concerning number, and we're seeing it not only in Italy, but also a similar trend in China. And Italy in particular, the numbers are staggering. 60% of confirmed cases in Italy are men, and more than 70% of deaths in Italy are men as well. And across the board during that coronavirus task board, they said men are up to two times as likely to die from this virus than women, regardless of the age group. Now, uh, the crazy thing here, Lindsay, is that we don't know why this is. They are still trying to investigate uh, what causes men to be more susceptible to this virus. There are some theories that in both of these cultures, men smoke more than women. Men also have underlying conditions like heart disease more than women. So it might be uh, that there's underlying causes like that. But Lindsay, right now, it is still anyone's guess why it seems to be targeting men over women. And of course, so much attention as it should be on what's happening in Italy. But the situation in Spain is also rapidly deteriorating too. Yeah, Spain is quickly becoming a hot spot, Lindsay. The numbers there overnight, another 199 people in just 24 hours. And uh, many of them are now speaking out, saying they wish their government had acted sooner. They had a month and a half from the first confirmed case. They had weeks while they watched Italy practically start to implode from this virus. And uh, as of recently as last week, there were still soccer matches going on. There was a huge march of more than 100,000 people that went through the city. So uh, many people are fearing that they acted too late and that they are going to be on the next hot spot. They also have a much larger 
larger elderly population. About one fifth of that country is over the age of 65. So that's also another concerning number. Uh, but it's not just Spain now that is sort of thinking about acting earlier. Many European countries are trying to get ahead of this as best they can learn from countries like Italy. And Lindsay, right here in the UK, a big announcement today from our prime minister just said that starting tonight at midnight, all pubs and restaurants are going to close. Uh, no large gatherings. So things are going to start looking a lot different here in the UK as of next week. All right, Maggie Rooley, thank you very much for that. And back here at home, President Trump is closing the southern border with Mexico to non-essential travel to stop what he claims is the danger of viral spread from undocumented immigrants. One of the nation's leading experts on pandemics, Dr. Anthony Fauci, supports the measure, saying there's a fundamental health reason for doing that. He also pushed back on some of the president's comments on possible treatment for the virus. ABC's senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has more. 24 hours after President Trump declared a malaria drug would be made available almost immediately to help treat coronavirus, Dr. Anthony Fauci declared the drug has not actually been proven to help. Is there any evidence to suggest that, as with malaria, it might be used as a prophylaxis no. against COVID-19? No, the, the answer is, is no. And, and the, the evidence that you're talking about, John, is anecdotal evidence. But President Trump pushed on leading to a rare public rebuke by the nation's foremost expert on infectious diseases. May work, may not work. Uh, I feel good about it. That's all it is, just a feeling. I, you know, I'm a smart guy. As you know the expression, what the hell do you have to lose? So I've been right a lot. Let's see what happens. I would like Dr. Fauci, if you don't mind, uh, to follow up on what the president is saying. Should Americans have hope in this drug right now? The president feels optimistic about something, his feeling about it. It might be effective, but as a scientist, as we're getting it out there, we need to do it in a way as while we are making it available for people who might want the hope that it might work, you're also collecting data that will ultimately show that it is truly effective and safe under the conditions of COVID-19. Fundamentally, I think it probably is going to be safe, but I like to prove things first. Cecilia Vega joins us now from Washington. Cecilia, just a few moments ago, we found out that a member of the vice president's office tested positive for coronavirus. Yeah, Lindsay, this is breaking news. It just came in right now, uh, as you said, from the vice president's office. This is a member of his team. This is not someone that they're identifying this point. And, and right now, the vice president's office will only say that neither the president nor the vice president had close contact with this ident unidentified person. But they do say that they're now going back to trace steps and find out who this person, exactly who this person and had contact with here. And Cecilia, things got a bit heated in the briefing room today. The president clearly unhappy with questions about the administration's track record on coronavirus. He's saying that he's not getting enough credit. Yeah, you know, I have to say, I've, I've covered a lot of these briefings, particularly over this week, since President Trump has been uh, showing up there in the briefing room. I've never seen him as angry as I saw him today. It's exactly what you said. He believes he's not getting a cre enough credit for the administration that his job, for the job that his administration is doing. He's very much blaming the Obama administration, he says, for, for what was left behind and the mess he's got, he's had to clean up. And he's really just been angered by any questions that challenge uh, where we are as, as an nation involving this administration and its handling of the coronavirus, uh, the crisis. But the, but I've never seen, Lindsey, frankly, an angry or president inside this briefing room. He was not happy with the reporters in there today. And there were a number of testy exchanges, uh, mine included, when he was asked just basic questions about what his message would be to Americans who are living in fear right now. But important and critical that we keep asking those questions. Cecilia Vega, thank you so much. Joining us now by phone, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Thanks so much for joining us, Senator. My pleasure. New York State now has the most cases of coronavirus in the U.S. Governor Cuomo announced today all non-essential businesses will close at 8 p.m. on Sunday. Now, we've heard from both Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio. They've said that they don't have the resources that they need. In your estimation, is New York getting the assistance that it needs from the federal government? Uh, no. New York and every other state in the country still do not have the testing they require. They also are experiencing shortages of masks and gloves and ventilators. And so the truth is the country was not ready for this on any level. And the federal government has not done a good job in getting testing to all states. They delayed, first of all, by saying only tests can be done through the CDC. Now, finally, the Trump administration has finally allowed every lab in America to do their own tests. 
Um, but still, I was talking to my county executives from around the state today, and almost every single one of them said, we are running out of tests. We can only do 100 or 200 a day. For, for a community as large as a million people, that's not sufficient. Uh, and so this, even statewide, uh, they are lacking in the supplies and resources they need to meet the need in our state. And, and let's talk about meeting the financial needs. Your colleague, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, has proposed a $1 trillion stimulus package. Do you plan on supporting that? And is that enough? I mean, would that be sufficient to help a single mother in Albany who may now be out of a job for several weeks? It won't be enough. And unfortunately, Senator McConnell has the wrong priorities in his bill. His bill is not pro-family. It is not pro-worker. It puts corporations before people. And it doesn't do nearly enough to address the public health crisis. Uh, what I've heard from my hospitals around the state, they need a Marshall Plan. They need a infusion of money to have the resources they need, the infrastructure they need, and the support for the people that they need. Uh, they also need to uh, hold these corporations accountable. If we're going to help companies, we have to make sure they don't have stock buybacks. They don't have um, CEO pay increases. Uh, common sense things that we can require if we're going to give them this kind of money. We also, the bill undermines paid leave uh, and sick leave. We want to have a national paid leave plan so for every worker they can take up to three months off to be with their families if they're sick, to be with children who have been sent home from school. Parents need that flexibility and they need to be able to take time off if they're sick. We also want to guarantee two weeks of sick days for every worker. So that stuff is not in McConnell's bill and so it's not nearly good enough. I do think we're going to need more than a trillion dollar of investment as time goes on, but the first instance, it has to have paid leave, it has to expand resources for hospitals, it has to have unemployment insurance for every unemployed worker. And uh, we have to make sure there's a real support for small businesses. Do you support the government sending checks to Americans? Some of your colleagues believe that more than that is necessary. What's your plan to help struggling New Yorkers, for example? So I think both paid leave, uh, unemployment insurance, and sick days will be more valuable ultimately than just a check. Um, for example, if every worker had paid leave, they'd have three months fully paid for, and they'd be getting... 66% uh, of their salary up to $4,000. So $4,000 is better than $1,000, and you want to make sure that people have access to their income, or at least a portion of it. Second, unemployment insurance needs to be generous, uh, far more generous than unemployment insurance is in most states. In some states, it's as low as $500. So we have to make sure that uh, people are getting the kind of resources they need to uh, put food on the table and pay their bills. We're also looking uh, for some kind of um, pause on mortgages and on rent payments, uh, some kind of legal ability for people to defer those payments till after this crisis, and that's something we can make resources available for as well. Uh, I think it'll be very important that we make that possible. And switching gears here, several of your colleagues, uh, reportedly Senator Richard Burr and Senator Kelly Loeffler, sold stocks after receiving a classified briefing about coronavirus. They're being accused of insider trading or, at the very least, unethical behavior. Burr says that he relied solely on public information, and Loeffler says that she's not involved in decisions around buying and selling stocks. Do you think that both or either should resign? I think both of these allegations need to be thoroughly investigated by the Department of Justice. I wrote the Stock Act, which is the law that says members of Congress cannot engage in purchasing or selling of stocks based on non-public information that they received because of their jobs. Both of these allegations appear that they had non-public information, top secret briefings, uh, closed door briefings, well in advance of the American public having that kind of information. And if they did buy or sell stocks with that information to profit themselves, uh, obviously that needs to be thoroughly investigated as a violation of the Stock Act. Well, considering that you wrote the bill, can you assure now the American people that you personally have not used inside information to sell off stocks or make a profit before the American public realized what was happening? Yes, I can promise you that. I don't own any stocks. Very simple answer. Okay, thank you. And lastly, what is the single thing that you're most concerned about as we go forward in these challenging times? The thing I'm most concerned about is that people are safe. Uh, it's important that we help our first responders have the tools they need to attack this virus head on. We need testing, every kind of testing made 
immediately available. Most places around my state, testing is limited. They're only actually able to test the very sick. So anybody who just has the symptoms of coronavirus can't just go and get a test, which means it's harder to stop the spread. So until we have rapid testing and readily available testing for anyone who's sick, we have no chance of limiting the spread of the coronavirus. Second, I want to make sure people have resources so that if they have lost their job or need to take leave because their children are home or because someone in their family is sick, they need access to real national paid leave. They need access to paid sick days, and they need access to unemployment insurance if they don't have it. And then if there's still people who are falling through the cracks, those individuals should be given employment insurance and just a straight-up check written so they can stay afloat during these next weeks and months ahead. All right, Senator Gillibrand, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. You have likely heard the phrase flatten the curve used when talking about reducing the number of coronavirus cases. But what does that mean exactly and how can we do it? For more on that, we'd like to bring in infectious disease expert and former federal virus hunter, Dr. Dennis Carroll, who joins us now live from Washington, D.C. Dr. Carroll, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So can you remind us of exactly what that means, flattening the curve, and why is that the most important thing for people to be thinking about right now? Well, I think it's we've seen actions taken in California, Illinois and New York that are indicative of the speed with which this virus is spreading across America, that if we let it continue to infect uh, at the direction it is now, using the limited interventions we have now, within three to four weeks, our health system is going to completely collapse. It'll be overwhelmed by the number of people seeking urgent care. Flattening the curve is basically what can we do to really profoundly impact on the number of people that are being exposed and infected. And if we don't really take the kind of actions that are being now undertaken in California and elsewhere, that we are in a really an historic position of facing a health crisis that we've never um, uh, faced before. So flattening the curve is basically how can we reduce the number of people exposed today so that three weeks from now, the numbers of people showing up at the health facility are far fewer than those that were showing up the day before. Now, when we look at that chart, it shows the flattening of the curve also means that the virus lasts longer. But I imagine there's no concern about prolonging the outbreak. Well, the, the biggest concern is that if we, in fact, uh, force our health system into a critical state, we're not only not going to be able to provide critical treatment for uh, this particular virus, but the health system itself is going to be challenged to provide normative uh, services for critical needs of people other than the virus. If we're able to flatten the curve and slow the number of people who are becoming infected, then the health system is better positioned uh, to be able to provide services not just for this virus, but for critical other health needs. Understood. Now, which countries have most effectively flattened the curve of their outbreaks, and how do they go about doing that? Well, clearly we've seen uh, South Korea. Uh, demonstrate through a robust uh, community effort to that they can break the spread of the virus and dramatically reduce the numbers of people uh, that are exposed and infected. Um, so we need to look at the South Koreas to really uh, ask ourselves, what can we do here um, to achieve the same outcome? And I think what we're seeing, and for instance, in California, is an example of the extraordinary measures that are going to be needed if we're going to really reduce the numbers of people who are infected over the next three weeks. Otherwise, we're going to look at an, an awful lot like what's going on in Italy today. Do you have a sense of what South Korea was able to do so effectively? Well, first off, they had uh, an extremely effective and widely distributed diagnostic capability, something that we have failed to do uh, until just recently. And they were able to use that information to be able to target and mobilize um, high-risk communities and high-risk groups uh, to be able to lower exposures and isolate and contain uh, the movement of that virus. So we are greatly handicapped uh, because of 
uh, the loss of opportunity to use diagnostics uh, to be able to tell us where the virus is, who's infected. Uh, so we're really in a much more vulnerable state uh, by the failure of being able to provide those critical early uh, interventions. All right, Dr. Carroll, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you. When we come back, our exclusive inside one of military's most crucial medical facilities where they are investigating the live coronavirus. Their goal, find a way to stop this crisis. The job loss is set to sweep this country. Some fear will be unlike anything we've ever seen. The first wave of impacted restaurant workers will speak to several of newly employed about what's next. But first, our myth of the day. time anytime nightline your mom said comb your hair your dad told you smart not your dog is judging you right now and your best friend just called you crazy we all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight now imagine getting your news like that no bull no spin just give it to me straight straightforward news straight to the heart of the story abc news straightforward right now how do you make sense of it all now afternoons on abc one place with the good information you need we are all in this together and we're going to get through this together pandemic what you need to know afternoons at 1 eastern 12 central and pacific on abc Welcome back. While well, people are doing their best to keep their spirits up, the nation's restaurants and the millions of Americans who prepare and serve our meals have been among the hardest hit by this pandemic. Restaurants could lose $225 billion in business, according to one industry group's report. And five to seven million jobs could be eliminated in that sector over the next three months. Our Devin Dwyer has a look now at how some laid off restaurant workers are coping and what restaurant owners are doing to try to keep their businesses alive. I am like wondering what I'm gonna do for like money and how I'm gonna support myself in the future um, coming weeks, but they are being very transparent. <laughs> They're telling us to file for unemployment and then hopefully when everything is over, they'll gladly hire us back. But they want us to be secure in like funding and like financial stuff. So that's why they're- We're having some technical issues with that piece. So we're gonna have to come back to Devin's story in just a little bit. But we'll let you know uh, that what restaurant owners say that they're doing when we come back. Still a lot to get into tonight. We've been tracking those severe storms from the Gulf Coast to the Northeast. And with so many of us spending more time at home, what else besides ABC News Live should you be streaming. But first, our tweet of the day, the classic king of the hill and social distancing. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. Do you trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania. Thank you. 
Welcome back. A pretty striking milestone. Stocks have now posted their worst week since 2008. The Dow sinking another 900 points today, trading below where it was when President Trump took office. This, of course, comes amid the growing coronavirus outbreak. And next week might look a little strange. The floor of the New York Stock Exchange will be closed starting Monday with all trading done electronically. But it's not all bad news. Some sectors are actually thriving during this crisis. Shares of the video conferencing company Zoom, they are way up. That company is actually now worth more than Uber. And if you are looking for a job, Amazon says that it will hire 100,000 workers. Walmart will add 150,000 jobs. And Pepsi says it will hire 6,000 full-time, full-benefit workers. And we still have a lot more to get into. As you know, we've been tracking the disturbing rise of attacks against Asian Americans during the coronavirus. Tonight, we will hear from some of those who are speaking out. And for millions, this was the first week homeschooling their children. Time for a progress report. We'll follow one family's experience. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. States are now shutting down non-essential businesses. California, Nevada, Illinois, New York. Essential services have to continue to function. Grocery stores need food. Pharmacies need drugs. Uh, your internet has to continue to work. New York leading the nation in the number of COVID-19 cases. California, where cases have also been spiking, implementing a similar order. We estimate in the United States, we heard this number across the rest of the world, that people, 30% of the population, as high as 70% of the population, may contract the virus. A heated discussion at today's White House briefing over whether a malaria drug being tested as a possible treatment for COVID-19 will be effective. The president and one of his top advisors disagree. It may work and it may not work. And I agree with the doctor what he said. May work, may not work. I feel good about it. That's all it is, just a feeling. The president feels optimistic about something, his feeling about it. What I'm saying is that it might, it might be effective. You're also collecting data that will ultimately show that it is truly effective and safe under the conditions of COVID-19. President Trump announcing his administration is moving tax day from April 15th to July 15th. Hopefully by that time we'll have people getting back to their lives. 
The administration also announcing that student loan payments will be suspended for at least the next two months. Senate Republicans and Democrats are still working with the White House to hammer out a more than trillion dollar stimulus plan to put money in people's pockets. The Senate expecting to work through the weekend to have a stimulus bill up for a final vote by Monday. Italy, with over 4,000 deaths, now has the most due to the virus. In just the past 24 hours, nearly 6,000 new confirmed cases and more than 600 deaths, bringing the death toll from this outbreak in Italy to more than 4,000. I never felt so stressed in my life. We are doing our best, but maybe it's not, it's not enough. The United States Army is, of course, known for going out on the front lines during high-risk missions and is on the ground during war. But now some are fighting what the president dubs the Invisible Army. Rachel Scott and our team were given exclusive access inside an Army lab closely studying the coronavirus as they try to find a way to win this war. At Fort Detrick in Maryland, Army scientists are armed with face masks, rubber gloves, and test tubes. They are on the front lines in the fight against the coronavirus. What we want to do is be able to prevent the disease, and the way to do that is through a vaccination. Some of the people here are going to be the heroes. They're going to help us defeat it. Our cameras rolling exclusively inside one of the military's most important research and medical facilities, U.S. AMRID. Researchers here growing a live sample of the coronavirus for testing, studying its characteristics and behavior to try and find what will prevent it. Behind these glass windows, lab techs are beginning a two to three week long process Process of multiplying and purifying the virus to understand how it spreads. As the pandemic sweeps across the world, a shortfall in treatment has sparked a global race to find a vaccine. Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy telling me they are under pressure and up against time. We don't have a lot of time because we're in this fight. People are dying. These people are working every day. I mean, they're working every day. Helping to lead that charge, Army Dr. Sure, John Dye. So this is actually a training lab that we use here at USAMRD to train individuals on how to work in containment. While scientists are working around the clock, a vaccine could still be 12 to 18 months away. People think 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine. That's a long road. So it is a long road. Not only do you have to develop the vaccine, like in the laboratory, the science part of the vaccine, but then you have to take that vaccine and you have to put it into human clinical trials to show that that vaccine is safe. And as millions practice social distancing, every day these doctors come into closer contact with the deadly virus than virtually anyone else. They showed me how they protect themselves before they step into the lab. Scrubs, a set of rubber gloves taped down, a respirator, a full face shield, gown and then another pair of gloves. This is all set. This is the protective gear. Yes, ma'am. For the lab technicians that are on the forefront of this. Fight. Yes, that is that is exactly what they would wear um, at USAMRED when they're working with uh, coronaviruses. At the Army's core is a call to deploy, fight and win no matter what the mission is. For ABC News Live, I'm Rachel Scott at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that report. And as we were reporting earlier, millions of Americans who prepare and serve our meals have been among the hardest hit by this pandemic. Restaurants could lose $225 billion in business, according to one industry group's report. And five to seven million jobs could be eliminated in that sector over the next three months. Our Devin Dwyer has a look now at how some laid off restaurant workers are coping and what restaurant owners are trying to do to keep their businesses alive. The COVID pandemic has turned America's restaurant hotspots into ghost towns. Once packed French bistros, Italian trattorias, and Spanish tapas bars now empty in the nation's capital in many major U.S. cities. I am like wondering what I'm going to do for like money and how I'm going to support myself in the future um, coming weeks. 20 year old Charnay Rayford was a server at Barcelona restaurant in D.C. before losing her job this week over coronavirus. They're telling us to file for unemployment and then hopefully when everything is over, they'll gladly hire us back. But they want us to be secure in like funding and like financial stuff. So that's why they're really pushing the unemployment. She's now joining what could be millions of Americans applying for unemployment benefits. I applied for unemployment. Max Reese was also laid off this week as a barista at Compass Coffee. 
I've never been laid off before. I was incredibly shocked. Reese says the stimulus checks for $1,200 per person and $2,400 per couple that Congress is considering will help cover his rent, but month. worries where he'll find uh, his I next think, job. You know, it's, it's something which is nice, but yeah, past that, I mean, I don't, I don't see it really being something that's going to help us through this entire situation. What's your biggest financial worry right now? Is it rent? Is it food? Is it health insurance? Is it wh Where would you say you're at on that? So you don't have any health insurance? right now. Right. Yeah, I don't. Some restaurant owners are trying to soften the blow. Rose Previtt, who owns two highly acclaimed restaurants in D.C., is extending health benefits for around 50 of her furloughed employees. When you start a new business, you think of all the terrible things that could could ruin you. And this is not one that I thought of. Global pandemic was not on my list of uh, worst case scenarios. But we have to let our entire front of house staff go. So that means servers, bartenders, uh, food runners and barbacks. And um, they were very, very difficult calls to make. Now Previtt's kitchens, like thousands of other restaurants, are for the first time attempting takeout service to keep at least some employees on the job. Hopefully, if we can keep this going, we'll be able to keep our kitchen staff working with minimal layoffs. So how, do, how does that actually work? How does a sit-down, high-end restaurant like yours actually convert to takeout? What did you have to do? Well, as you see, you have to buy a lot of to-go containers that you didn't have before. And uh, since we have all this room upstairs here now, uh, we're just going to fill it with boxes. As you can see from downstairs, we've been like piecing together sort of an assembly line now to make it as efficient as possible. But simultaneously, we have to figure out a creative way to not bring too many people here at the same time. Are you finding people actually want to have that restaurant-style, high-end meal? at their home and, and during this time? The neighborhood, like we've had more, so many people just say like, we're buying this to support you, we know what you're going through. It means so, so, so much. But many restaurants have had to close their doors entirely. The owners of Little Sesame, a lunchtime favorite in the DC business district, shut down this month. Hi, how are you? They're now trying to pay it forward by giving out free meals to the community. It looks like we got some couscous, some uh, chicken and cauliflower stew. Trying to use all of the last ingredients that we have uh -huh. to not waste. So these were uh, goods you'd usually use in your products for lunchtime crowd, but right. they're going to go bad. So yeah, they, these are actually things that are on our menu. Edgar Morales, a Guatemalan immigrant and father of three, lost his job this week because of the pandemic. First of all, uh, the rent is coming, so um, we'll see what we can do, you know, to solve that problem, you know. It's very, it's very, very tough. Uh, do you have much savings stored up? Uh, not really. For now, many restaurant workers are trying to remain optimistic. As their employers, those restaurateurs do all they can to stave off shutting their doors for good. If this drags on, the White House is saying possibly July and August, are you, is there sort of a, a worst case scenario for you where you have to fold? The smaller the business, the definitely the harder the hit, and we are still piecing it together as we go to see what we're going to be able to do, how scrappy we can get, how many other inventive ideas we can come up with, but it's terrifying to think that we wouldn't be able to open until after summer. You have such a positive attitude mm -hmm. about all of this. It's just very uplifting to me. Yeah, what, what, what no, I say, like What try. do you say to people who are panicked? Things are going to move forward. People are still being born every day. Like, there's new things being created. There's new solutions happening, so. We need to hope for a solution to end this pandemic quickly and get all of us back to those dinner tables ready to share a meal. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin. Restaurant advocates say one of the best ways to help your favorite local dining establishment stay afloat is to participate in takeout programs that they may be offering at this time and also to buy gift cards, which offer them an infusion of cash now, which you can claim later once they reopen. As the coronavirus impacts communities around the globe, here at home, Asian Americans are facing more than just the fear of contracting the virus. They say that hurtful and misleading language from our nation's leaders are now making things worse. Our Kira Phillips first brought this up uh, in a story last week, and she now has this follow-up. As Asian Americans continue to share stories of violence and discrimination, Messaging from some of our politicians not making it any easier. From the Secretary of State. Uh, before I uh, address uh, the efforts that we've been engaged in to push back against the Chinese virus. To members of Congress. The culture where people eat bats and snakes and dogs and things like that 
these viruses are transmitted from the animal to the people, and that's why China has been the source of a lot of these viruses like SARS, like MERS, the swine flu. To the President of the United States. And I'd like to begin by providing an update on what we are doing to minimize the impact of the Chinese virus on our nation's students. These labels and titles continuing to trigger acts of hate across the country. Asian American outrage now trending on Twitter, reacting to the president's language. Trump's comments, what it does is distance uh, Asians from the rest of America and the rest of the world by targeting Asians and putting a face, a culture as someone or something to blame for this virus. Sam Louie is one of those voices, criticizing the president in his blog, saying, by calling it the Chinese virus, he is perpetuating the fear, hatred, and in some cases, violence against Chinese and Asians worldwide. I have to be extra careful that if I sneeze, because I know I'm Asian, and more specifically Chinese, what are people going to think? Asian lawmakers now united. New York Congresswoman Grace Meng concerned by the administration's messaging. What do you want to hear from the president now that you have seen a spike in hate crimes towards your constituents and other Asian American communities? I want him to call the virus by its proper name and not use racist tactics to divert from a lack of responsibility or a lack of responsiveness that we've seen from his administration. California Congressman Ted Lieu in his op-ed for the Washington Post on Wednesday saying Trump's rhetoric adds fuel to the growing fire of hatred being misdirected at Asian Americans. The fact that he is the president of the United States who is responsible for the well-being of all Americans only makes his rhetoric even more disturbing. ABC's senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega pressing the president. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of it comes say from it's China. Racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. It comes from China. I and want to be accurate. About yeah, please, in this John. Country. Please. Behind you. Uh, Are you comfortable I have with a great. This term? I have great love. Uh, for all of the people from our country. But uh, as you know, China tried to say at one point, maybe they stopped now, that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen. It's not going to happen. Not as long as I'm president. Uh, it comes from China. This isn't the first time a virus has been named after its place of origin, official or otherwise. West Nile virus from the Nile region, Zika from the Zika forest, and Spanish flu, named after an outbreak in Spain, despite its origins elsewhere. Coronavirus did stem from China. However, CDC director and member of the president's virus task force, Robert Redfield, broke with those GOP lawmakers during a congressional hearing, saying it was wrong to refer to COVID-19 as a Chinese coronavirus. It is absolutely wrong and inappropriate to call this the, the Chinese coronavirus. That would, I, I assume you would agree with that. Yes. The latest Hollywood star diagnosed with COVID-19 is Daniel Day Kim of Lost and Hawaii Five-0. The actor sharing the news via social media, detailing his journey with coronavirus on video in an effort to help others amid this pandemic and called for prejudice against Asians to end. Lindsay? All right, our thanks to Kira for that. Across the country, many students are being homeschooled for the very first time, in some cases by parents who are also working from home and now thrust into the role of teacher. Gianna Rodriguez, a mom of four boys in Miami, all in different grades, documented what her first week at home was like. So let's see how it all went down in the Merlo Rodriguez household. Day one of being at home with all four kids who are doing what we call here distance learning. And I'm working remotely from home on my laptop, on my phone. And it has been pretty chaotic to get four kids to do four different grade levels worth of work done at the same time. Day two. And this is what it sounds like at this table. Everyone's trying to finish doing stuff. <laughs> Stop. 
How do you like doing school C work at home? C. Great, because zero. Lucas, how do you like doing your school work at home? Not very much, because some people are talking oh, really? a lot. Ready, and lift. One, two. <sighs> so day three. I bought headphones for two of my kids, my smaller two, so to keep them focused. And I just walked in there and it was like WWE Smackdown. It's been very difficult to do all of this because I have to be conscious of um, the things I'm doing for work and my kids and the schedule. I get to the end of the day and I'm tired. Like I could not explain this exhaustion to anyone. Was it hard doing schoolwork at home? Yes. Why? Because I had to do all this reading, math, Spanish, science, social studies. They did pretty well. They all get up with no problem at 7.30, and then they're ready to start school at 8.30. I am tired, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. I am exhausted, but, you know, what else can I do? Millions of Americans with a renewed appreciation for the value of teachers. And when we come back, the song about the coronavirus that's topping the charts and the moving images of the week. Right now, how do you make sense of it all? Now, afternoons. For our test results so it's been over five days now so we're going to be going home and quarantine for another 14 days um more than likely <laughs> that's an update from michelle heckert and her grandma they were quarantined after getting off the grand princess cruise ship in oakland and as grandma mentioned once the california residents leave travis air force base they'll still be on lockdown with the rest of the state Yesterday, Michelle posted a video of a song that she wrote about the ordeal. You can check her out on Twitter at what the hecker. <laughs> Movie theaters across the country are closing their doors, but there are now more options to stream your favorite movies at home after watching us, of course. Jason Nathanson files this report. Self-isolation has people streaming movies and TV shows in droves, but what to watch? For the first time ever, Universal releasing movies at home that are currently in theaters with The Hunt and The Invisible Man. And Focus Features will stream its Jane Austen comedy, Emma. Those are out Friday, and Universal says the upcoming Trolls movie will be released at home the day it was supposed to be in theaters, April 10th. They expect to pay 20 bucks a pop to stream those films. Peace and love, Tiny and Daddy, ow! Out now, Disney has made its massive hit Frozen 2, available to stream early on its streaming service, Disney+, Plus, and the Star Wars film The Rise of Skywalker dropped early for purchase. Force brought us together. It'll also cost you 20 bucks wherever you rent your movies. A couple of new TV dramas came out this week. Hulu's adaptation of the wildly popular book Little Fires Everywhere, starring Kerry Washington and Reese Witherspoon. I need to figure out who this woman is. On HBO, there's the timely political series, The Plot Against America. On Netflix, it's the miniseries Self Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. Octavia Spencer stars in the rags to riches story about one of the early 20th century's only female African American millionaires. And it's a great time to catch up on those shows everyone always talked about, but you never got around to HBO's The Wire, The Sopranos. Don't let anyone ever make you feel like you don't have any then Game of Thrones are a good place to start. Netflix and AMC have all of Breaking Bad and its spin-off Better Call Saul. It's showtime, folks. Or check out Donald Glover's brilliant series Atlanta on FX on Hulu. Let's do it again and just like this time like you're at a party and everything's crazy. <laughs> Which also has a new show, Dave, based on the life of rapper Little Dicky. It'll hopefully make you laugh during these stressful times. Jason Nathanson, ABC News, Hollywood. We all need a reason to laugh, and now there is an unusually inspired song burning up social media, stemming from this moment with rapper Cardi B. Coronavirus! Coronavirus! <laughs> I'm telling you, it's real! It's getting real! Woo! 
Well, after that, the internet did its thing, and a remix was born. DJ I Marquise posted this lighthearted remix, which is now dominating TikTok feeds and even climbing to the iTunes charts. Uh, after a fan tweeted a suggestion to donate proceeds from the song, Cardi confirmed that was actually the plan all along. And that is our show for this hour. Thank you so much for streaming with us. And before we go, we want to leave you now with the powerful images that caught our eye this week. Enjoy your weekend and please stay safe. Mm -hmm.